Good morning and welcome to our cybersecurity webinar. I am Frances Karaya, Technology Advisor at the Central Bank, and I will be your moderator for today's session. I'm joined today by our presenters, Governor Alvin Hilaire, Mrs. Michelle Francis Panto, Deputy Inspector, Financial Institutions, and Mrs. Keisha Lashley, Assistant Manager, Information and Cybersecurity. Following their presentations, we will open the floor for your questions, and I hand over now to our first presenter, Governor Alvin Hillier. Yes, thank you, Francis. Uh, welcome, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, to our Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. We are really excited and happy that you took the time to be with us for this very interesting and informative um, presentation. Let me start by saying it is, it is no exaggeration that our financial institutions across the world, in fact, are heavily dependent on technology. It is quite um, remarkable to think that just some time ago, you didn't have online transactions, but now this is the world that we live in, and it's hard to imagine nothing with online transactions, ATMs, and, and so forth. So this is why we are gathered here today to talk about cybersecurity, which is a major uh, thing that all financial institutions have to deal with. Now let's talk about technology and financial stability. Of course, these go hand in hand, and they do reinforce each other. In fact, as a country becomes more modern, its financial institutions become more savvy, there is intense competition and they go together. So technology reinforces financial stability and they can't go without moving hand in hand. But they also may threaten each other. And here is where it is important to be on top of the game. What do I mean? Because of the speed of transactions, because of the interconnectedness in today's world, it means that things can move very quickly. And one problem in one part of the financial sector can easily mushroom into the rest of the financial sector very quickly. Social media doesn't help because once you have something that is happening, everybody knows about it in real time. Rumors spread, panic could, could ensue, and you could have something that burgeons very, very quickly. So we have to be aware of the importance of technology, but also the threats to financial stability. Now, let me give an example of, of what we used to think of a, as a typical bank robbery that you would see on, on TV. So somebody comes in with a mask, they give a note, and then they say, well, give me your money, and they have a getaway car, and they, 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 um, they get away or they don't get away. So this is our typical bank robbery. You still have that, but now, guess what? People could rob a whole bank without being in the country. So you could be in, the bandits could be in Korea, they could be in Australia, they have a cyber attack. And guess what? The whole financial institution could be compromised. You could have ransomware, you could have identity theft and all these sort of things. In fact, you don't even have to be on, on the land. So somebody could be in a submarine or somebody could be in, in a satellite in outer space and they still have a cyber attack. This is how serious and how, how anonymous this thing could be. So we have to be very careful. Some of the things that we are accustomed to thinking about in, in the cyber uh, threat landscape include card skimming, identity theft, uh, ransomware, and all those. So, so let's be fully aware of this. Now, central banks around the world have been taking countermeasures, and there's, there's a, a huge wave of activity on the international front to try to, to understand the, the situation and to deal with it. So we have international efforts, and domestically, we are also working towards uh, improving our cybersecurity defenses. Let me mention three aspects. One is education. So people should be aware of cyber threats. And here's where our national financial literacy program comes in. The other is redress, where people could have some way of dealing with it. And our Office of the Financial Services Ombudsman will be dealing more with that. And the third is market conduct, or how institutions behave. And this is where we are talking about today. How could we get our financial institutions to adopt 
best practices. Most of them already have them, but maybe there's a way of codifying, making it simple, making it appealing, and making it implementable. So the market conduct and the guidelines come in. Now, the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago has been actively thinking about cybersecurity for quite some time. If you look at our strategic plan some years ago and the current strategic plan, it features very prominently. Now, most recently, in order to, to boost this, we have invited the, the IMF for technical assistance, and we had really tremendous experience with them. And I must commend a really dedicated team from the fund for being with us. And it was look, to look at two aspects. One is the cybersecurity of our own operations, and the second is cybersecurity of financial institutions. In that regard, we are working towards a guideline that would be given to financial institutions that they would be able to, to utilize for their own operations. But we want to go a step further, not only for licensees, but for other institutions such as credit unions. We hope that they would adopt this uh, in a meaningful fashion and we would all have you know, a certain common set of uh, standards. So our expectations today are quite high for this, for this, um, this endeavor, this uh, engagement with you. We expect to get a lot of interesting questions, comments, and to start the ball rolling. And then we will be able to issue the guidelines in, I would say, mid-September. So we're privileged to have today Francis who are moderating our show. Then we have Keisha from our, uh, in our financial technology department who will tell us about what are the threats, how did, how did this come about and so forth. And then we have Michelle from our inspection department to give us an outline of the guidelines. So we look forward to this. We are very excited and we, look, we anticipate uh, a rounding set of, of um, engagement. So thank you and let me turn to, uh, to Keisha and then, then Michelle. Thank you so much, Governor. I now invite everyone to picture this scenario. Up one morning and you learn that your financial instrumentator is available for sale on the dark web. You go to their application, available, go to their website, and it has been you do. These are some of the attacks that financial institutions face on a daily basis. And even in this climate, they are still expected to deliver a service that is both resilient and secure. We know that technology allows us to execute our functions. It helps us to be innovative, to be creative, just to do things better. There's a lot of conversation now about artificial intelligence and machine learning and how these supercomputers will change the very way that we do things. These are exciting times for us, but we know that even though technology brings opportunities, there are also risks. And as Governor said, criminals are not restrained to their borders. In fact, when we look at some of the attacks that happen right here at the bank, sometimes the countries are far away from where we are at. But at the same time, our clients and our stakeholders, they still demand a lot of us. They say to our central bank, what's happening with the e-money issuers? We hear you guys talking about a digital currency. We want to hear more of the, these things. We want to move to a cashless society. And I know that just as they demand a lot of us, they also demand a lot of you, our financial institutions. And one thing that is consistent is that the attacks are sophisticated and they happen all day, every day. One thing that we need to understand is really who is behind all these attacks. These threat actors, they are motivated by different reasons. They are in no means a monolith. So one particular group may be motivated by financial reasons. And of course, for our sector, where well, we are treasure true, they love us. There's another group that may be motivated by a particular cause that they want to draw attention to. So therefore, if they compromise your institution, they would be able to say, we are the ones that did it. And now that we have your attention, here's the cause we want you to focus on. There's another group that they are motivated at a national level. So they seek to bring disruptions to your critical infrastructure. 
So again, they are all motivated by different things. What is consistent though, is that they perform with concerns, they learn us. They have time to sit down and study us and figure out the best way to attack us. They are stealthy and they continually look for vulnerable targets. At the end of it, they have to get it right once, whereas those who defend organizations, we have to get it right all the time. So as we understand the mindset of those that attack us, we'll be able to shape and tweak our defenses accordingly. These malicious actors are very organized. They are well-resourced and skilled. This is not a fly-by night thing. And even in cases where they are not, they offer cybercrime as a service. And when you look at it, you see how the ransomware developers, they work, they have operating models, they have tech reports. You know, I recently looked at a particular cyber attack. And within that one institution, there were five different threat actors operating, all motivated by different reasons. This is what we are up against. Once we understand the threat actors, we also need to understand the different threats that we face. They are diverse. One, one that is always um, up for discussion is that of phishing. You're always hearing about it. Can you say to yourself, well, you said if you know about phishing, why aren't institutions doing more to stop it? And you think about it, it is difficult because the attackers play on something that is intrinsic and internal to us. And it is that need to know. So I get an email. I don't even know who the sender is, you know. But I say, what's this they sending me, boy? I double click on it. I click on the link. Just a desire to know. And therefore, when we examine the different types of attacks which are successful, the root cause is truly a human element. So whether it is a phishing email that is successful, stolen credentials, errors in terms of misconfiguration, they all point to the human element. Next thing I want to discuss is that of ransomware. Is this the only type of malware? No, it is not but it is one that is very, very attractive to the criminals because of the different ways that they can monetize it. They can exfiltrate your data, compromise your operation, and try to extort you in different ways. And therefore, we have to train our people up. We have to continually reduce vulnerabilities and strengthen consumers. Within the bank, we also execute phishing exercises with our people. And I remember one user, you know, calling me and saying, Makisha, man, you check, man. And I had to remind the person, listen, the attackers don't play fair, you know. So it's better we teach you and show you how to recognize it than we wait for somebody else to do so. So we have to look at the safeguards. The attackers seek to penetrate, blend in, and launch their attacks. There's something known as living off the land. And what they do is they utilize things that are native to our operations, native to our operating system. And they are able to blend in in such a way that those of us who examine and look at their traffic, it's a question of, is this legitimate or is it not? The other thing that we need to be mindful of is that they work together. There was a particular attack that happened recently where one threat actor, which is particularly skilled in breaching the organization, they did that. And then they handed the battle over to a second threat actor to continue with the attack. Again, this is not a space for the pains of heart. Those who defend organizations, we have to do it well. There are multiple outcomes and consequences, but within our sector, we know it's all about the money. They can obtain different streams of income through stolen credentials. Our data, of course, is very valuable. Your credit card information, those things are all multiple streams of income for them. The second thing that is important is that our reputation is worth everything. People need to have confidence that you can deliver a service that is secure. And therefore, if they see well, Keisha's credit union or Keisha's um, bank, if they feel that I can't deliver a service, they say, look, Lisa, for Kisha, yes? Let me check somebody else. So your reputation is important. 
when we in an institution has a disruption, of course, your operations are impacted. But there's also the risk of contagion, where again, you may say, well, if Tisha's bank are handling her stories, I ain't trust Francis Bank, I ain't trust Michelle Bank. Let me try something else. So these are things that we have to be mindful of as we operate in this sector. So you may say to yourself, well, Kishé, make some good points about the threats actors. Understand a little bit about the threats. But what is the central bank doing to manage this risk? And I will say to you that we also have a multi prong approach. We recognize that we have to apply controls across our data, across our estates, across our network, across our infrastructure. It must be multi-layered. The second thing that we have to do is build capacity. We have to ensure that we can continue our operations and build our incident response capabilities. At the end of the day, I would love to tell Governor, Governor, we could, don't worry, we have things under control, but it is always going to be a journey to get better. One thing that we need to know is that the bank is uniquely positioned where we can partner with international agencies. And we learn from them, the IMF, the World Bank, Bank of International Settlements. We're able to share information, have exchanges, learn from. We share information with our partners. That's what it's all about. Another area that the bank wants to assist in is building our threat intelligence as a community. We have to learn from each other. And I'll give you an example. One of my colleagues at a central bank regionally, we were having a conversation about a project. And he can that they would have received a phishing email. As he explained the different indicators, I recognize that we have also received that same phishing email. And what we recognize in, at that moment is that we needed to share information. Because if I had known about his experience, we could have proactively updated our defenses and therefore reinforced the need for us to share info as a community. And that led to an info sharing group across central banks in the region. And this is one thing that we want to do within our own sector. It's important for us to build that defense community in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore our friends over at the Trinidad and Tobago Cybersecurity Incident Response Team, TTC CERT, we want to establish an information sharing and analysis center, an ISA. Let's see how to show us our ISA. That is a place that institutions can share information with respect to indicators of compromise, attacks that you are seeing. It's important for us to know what we are seeing locally so that other people can update their defenses. And we look forward to participation of the community, support, we welcome your, your ideas in us operationalizing this in a particular way. So at the end of it, the bank wants to establish a baseline. We want our institutions to have a standard that they can draw on and use to help build their own maturity levels. We understand that there are some institutions that are more mature than others. And you may say, well, we already adopt a lot of these things. We already have these things in place. Good. We, have, we adhere to international best practices. We're happy to hear that. What we would say is that as you take the guideline and you map controls, you will see that there's tremendous alignment. And you will say, okay, well, this is something that we can look at and use. For those institutions, however, that are not as mature and where your cybersecurity team might be one person, you can also use this guideline to help you to develop and to establish your own program. At the end of the day, the bank wants to strengthen and build resilience in the sector. And this guideline is one of the avenues that we are using to help establish this. So I'll now hand you over to Michelle, who will take you through the details of the guideline. Thank you, Keisha. Also definitely laying the tracks for the discussion on the central bank's guideline on cyber risk management. The draft guideline draws on international best practices in cybersecurity and will apply to financial institutions regulated by the central bank. 
namely licensed banks and non-banks, insurers and intermediaries, occupational pension plans, payment system operators and providers, e-money issuers and bureau de change. However, as Governor indicated, other financial sector participants, such as securities firms and credit unions, can choose to adopt the guideline to strengthen their cybersecurity practices. The cybersecurity framework to be established should be proportionate to the size, business activities, and risks faced by the financial institution. In this regard, the draft guideline will set out the bank's expectations for financial institutions with respect to cybersecurity, will strike a balance between principles and prescription in recognition of the different levels of sophistication of financial institutions, and will cover key areas such as governance, risk management, IT resilience, and, and third-party risks. The guideline will cover several elements. However, there are six key areas that I wish to highlight today. These are governance and risk management, security awareness and training, incident reporting, business continuity and recovery planning, cybersecurity testing, and information sharing. It is a basic principle that good governance and risk management of cyber risks are essential to protect the security of information systems and data. So the guideline will go into some detail in this area, but will also refer to other guidelines issued by the Central Bank on corporate governance and outsourcing risks as relevant. Effective governance and risk management practices should ensure effective board oversight by delineating the board's responsibilities for approval of the cybersecurity strategy, risk appetite, and policies. Ensuring a robust risk management framework is instituted and ensuring that it receives and reviews regular reports on cyber risk and cybersecurity. The roles and responsibilities of senior management should also be clearly defined and should include responsibility for implementing an effective cybersecurity framework that is in line with the institution's business model and risks. Implementing the board approved policies and developing relevant procedures and systems to operationalize said policies and ensuring that regular reports on the institution's cybersecurity and cyber risks are provided to the board. The board and senior management must also ensure that the financial institution's cybersecurity strategy is aligned to the institution's overall business strategy and sets out clear cybersecurity objectives. The policies, procedures, standards, and systems that are established should be consistent with the institution's cybersecurity strategy and reviewed and updated regularly. The governance framework to be instituted should ensure that independent audits or reviews of the cybersecurity framework is conducted. This could be conducted by the institution's internal audit department if capacity allows, or it can be outsourced to external professionals. However, where the function is outsourced, the audit findings should be subject to stringent review by the financial institution's audit committee. Backup and recovery processes should be audited annually and a process of tracking and monitoring of cybersecurity audit issues should be established. A robust risk management framework for cyber risk should entail adequate processes and systems for risk identification, risk analysis, risk mitigation, and risk monitoring and reporting. Risk identification entails identification of cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities applicable to the IT environment including internal and external networks, hardware, software, system interfaces, and people. At a minimum, adequate risk analysis and evaluation processes should ensure that cyber and information security risk assessments are conducted at least annually. Risk mitigation and control measures should be consistent with the criticality of the informational assets and level of risk appetite, and a risk register should facilitate risk monitoring and reporting cyber risk. James McKay, the Chief Operating Officer of Meta Compliance 
and a recognized security awareness training expert wrote, and I quote, the key challenge for organizations is how to tackle the ever-changing threat landscape. Security awareness training is the best place to start to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and giving staff the information required to recognize and react to cyber threats will mitigate risk and embed a culture of cybersecurity awareness, end quote. Therefore, institutions should establish a security awareness training program to a price of cybersecurity policies and procedures, to generate buy-in and commitment towards cybersecurity initiatives and reduce human error and mitigate security risks. Training should be provided at least annually to all staff and the content of the training program should include topics such as identification of malicious applications, the types of cyber attacks, and how to report the occurrence of an incident to management and to the board. In addition, the training program should identify specific um, groups so that are high risk or sensitive groups, such as uh, specific training for high risk or sensitive groups, such as executives, and users with privileged access. Institutions can be subject to numerous attacks on a daily basis. So it's also important to implement an adequate incident management framework to assist with discovering and dealing with threats. The main objective of this incident management and reporting framework is to ensure that incidents are detected, logged, and managed to minimize impact on affected systems and business processes. An effective incident management framework should entail, among other things, an early warning system with alerts to provide timely notification of an event, timely reporting of significant events to senior management and the board, and a communication plan that outlines processes and procedures to notify customers of the impact on services and any preventative measures that they should take, and also ensures timely notification and updates are provided to the regulators. To facilitate timely notification to the regulator, we have also developed a draft template for notification of any cyber incidents, and we will be seeking your feedback on this template during the consultation process. Despite best efforts, incidents will occur from time to time. Accordingly, institutions must implement robust business continuity and disaster recovery plans to minimize outages and disruptions from business to business operations. Business continuity plans are intended to ensure that critical functions remain operational and should identify all critical assets and functions, be tested routinely to ensure plan effectiveness, ensure that sensitive data is encrypted to protect it from theft, and ensure that relevant stakeholders are aware of and trained in their responsibilities during a cyber attack. On the other hand, effective disaster recovery plans should ensure that business operations can be restored as quickly as possible after an attack, and should set recovery time objectives, identify personal roles, take inventory of hardware and software, outline response procedures, and create a crisis communication plan. Business continuity and disaster recovery plans must take into consideration any material third parties. Testing, as you would have heard, is a critical aspect of cybersecurity, of a cybersecurity framework. Cybersecurity testing should include vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and remediation management. Vulnerability assessments of technology assets to identify security weaknesses should be conducted regularly, and at a minimum should include vulnerability discovery and identification of weak security configurations. Penetration testing should be commensurate with the identified risk in business processes and systems and should be conducted in the production environment. Remediation management processes should track and resolve any issues identified from the cybersecurity assessment. And at a minimum, should include severity assessments and classification of the issue. 
risk assessment and mitigation strategies, and timeframes for the remediation of issues. No man is an island, and this saying holds true for cybersecurity. Technologies are shared across a multitude of organizations, and institutions may be using the same third-party service provider. Consequently, organizations have common dependencies and therefore common weaknesses. Active sharing of threat information is encouraged as it allows one institution's detection to become another's prevention, thereby pre um, promoting cyber resilience of the financial system as a whole. While financial institutions should ensure that security threats are shared with internal employees, effective information sharing goes beyond the organization, and institutions should establish a central hub to facilitate timely sharing of threat information to prevent cyber attacks. This should be a formal structure, but of course must consider how issues of confidentiality and competitiveness will be treated, what information should be shared, and what processes could be developed, including engagement of external media or brand protection services to detect and respond to misinformation related to the institution. I have now taken you through six of the key areas of, to be covered in the draft guideline at a high level. What happens next is that we want to hear from you. We intend to complete, complete the draft guideline by the end of June, no, no later than the end of June, for your comments by end July. Thereafter, all comments will be considered and we expect to issue the final guideline by mid-September, as the governor would have indicated. I now hand you back to the moderator, Francis, who will take us through the Q&A session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you to our presenters for those insights. We now move to the Q&A section. So I invite our online participants to post their comments and questions in the chat box, and we will get to them. For those of you who wish, who prefer, you can raise, you can use the raise your hand button, and we will uh, ask you to unmute and ask your question. So let's jump right into it. There's a question submitted by Mr. Vindra Maraj of TTSEC. Should information storage be included as a standalone element in the guideline or be included in item six to perhaps read information storage and sharing? The storage of an institution's information is also of vital importance. And although briefly mentioned under business continuity and recovery, consideration should be given to giving more guidance on same for whether, for example, whether the use of cloud storage is advised. Michelle, would you care to take that one? Sure. Um, when we talk about information sharing in this context, it is not about the information that is stored within the entity. It is about sharing relevant information to other financial, with other financial sector entities to strengthen their cybersecurity. Hence, that section may not be the right place to address this issue. Um, in addition, I would want to add the guideline does not specify how you should store your data, or it will not specify that, how you should store your data, but rather speaks to the recommended controls that should be put in place to protect your stored data. So the guideline will speak to um, things like data and infrastructure management and provide best practices for maintaining your data, network, and system security. Um, with respect to the, all right, I think that's it. Or do you want to be able to? No. We have another question submitted. Thank you, Michelle. We have another question submitted in advance. We can all agree that cyber attacks have been a reality in the financial landscape for some time now. What has prompted the central bank to have this conversation and to introduce the guidelines at this time? Governor? Yes, thanks very much. I think it's something that we have always been aware of, and it's just a matter of, of transition. We started to look at it independently, and over time we have said, well, let's let's find out what's happening at, in the wider sphere. So we have um, a, a strong collaboration with other central banks through uh, an IT committee, and we share things about different attacks, how they're dealing with, with, with things, and so forth. 
And then we said, well, let's take it to the other level. Let's talk to the IMF and see not um, necessarily what they would recommend for our situation, but what are the global experiences? What are the global best practices? And specifically, what do central banks have to deal with? And how do they, as regulators, uh, encourage the financial system to be uh, resilient on the cyber front? So it is a natural transition. And we think it is quite timely and it is um, really an exciting area. So um, this is how we got into it. And this is where we are at now. And as I said, we want to start with the licenses, but we want to broaden it and have everyone have a common sense of this, um, this situation and common standards. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Question from Mark Lindsay via WebEx. This is all terribly impressive, but how will compliance be enforced without legislation to empower the central bank to take action? What is the central bank experiencing in the local landscape with regard to compliance with recommendations and information sharing? Michelle? Sure. Well, based on the central bank's legislative framework, um, while we, we consider guidelines to be other enforceable means, meaning that when we issue a guideline um, and we assess your compliance with the guideline, we can, if you're insufficiently compliant, compliant, we can make recommendations to strengthen that um, and we can issue compliance directions if you are not sufficiently complying or if you're not taking us on. So it is, it's, while it's not legislation per se, there is still, um, there's still action that the central bank can take if you refuse to institute best practices. That's the other part of the question. I can't see the question. Yes. Some part of the question. So what is the central bank experiencing in the local landscape with regard to compliance with recommendations and information sharing? All right. Um, well, the, the central bank has not issued a guideline on cybersecurity at present, but within the period 20 to 2020 to 2021, the central bank would have conducted a thematic review of institution cybersecurity risk management practices. And that assessment was done against the um, federal financial, I think it's FIFAC, federal financial institution, I think it's a U.S. agency. But it's a, they had a tool, a cybersecurity assessment a tool that we would have used to assess the institutions against. And um, based on that tool, we would have seen where certain gaps were, were there and the strengths in terms of risk management and where there were gaps. And we would have published a web a thematic review um, report that was published on the website last year. So that would have identified some of the areas like where the institutions may not have had um, a cybersecurity strategy in place, or they were not doing sufficient monitoring. But in general, we found that there was a lot of compliance against that tool. Thank you, Michelle. And only commercial banks, just to make sure that it was only commercial banks that we would have looked at. Question from Surendra Maraj via WebEx. Kisha, I think this one is for you. How can we become part of the Information Sharing and Analysis Center? So, hi, Surendra. Thank you very much for the question. Um, what we would advise is if you have an interest in being part of our initial um, group, please just register that in the chat. So, we're looking for a few institutions to work with the bank and TTC search so that we can get the parameters established how we want to share information, who will host it, you know, just what legal things we need to put in place to just ensure the information sharing. So you can just let us know in the chat. Those persons that are monitoring will get that information onto me and we will set up at least an initial sub-team. And once we have it formalized, we will invite um, to the sector to join us. We have another question submitted in advance. Is the central bank considering the licensing of digital banks? And if yes, what are the requirements? Do they differ from traditional brick and mortar requirements? Michelle? At the present time, the central bank is considering amendments to the Financial Institutions Act. 
but for an issue like a digital bank, it would be currently it would be treated no different than a, a by the existing banks. In fact, existing banks are adopting more and more um, digital um, financial products and services, and and therefore the same regulatory requirements will apply. So you will be required to establish a, at least a head office. You may have a limited branch network, but the, the same conditions will apply at present. During our review of the Financial Institutions Act, if there are additional um, issues that we need to address, we will include it in the requirements for a pure digital bank. But cybersecurity will want be one of the issues that we will really focus on in a pure digital bank. Thank you. Another question via WebEx from Chad McDonald. Does compliance or non-compliance with regards to cybersecurity preparedness have any impact on the DIC coverage? Michelle? Um, no, and in short, <laughs> DIC coverage is dependent on your deposit base, right? So the, the security preparedness will not impact that at all. Good. And questions are coming fast and furious. Question from Adele by Rameshwar. Organizations in general are reluctant to share information. Would there be a requirement to share information or would it be voluntary only? Michelle? Well, based on um, our discussion today, it would be voluntary. We, we can't mandate that they share, but it's more um, understanding the nature of cybersecurity and understanding the risk of not sharing um, and, and the way how sharing will assist in promoting resilience of the financial sector as a, as a whole, including their financial institution. So I think it will be strongly encouraged, but we cannot, we will not be mandating that they, they share information. Okay. Question via WebEx again from Robert Bupsing. Will the TTISAC be connected formally or informally with the US FSISAC? I'm asking since many of our vendors and platforms include supply chain dependencies on cloud, and SaaS services. Keisha? Uh, Robert, uh, we have not um, determined just yet as to whether there will be a connection or not. The discussions are really preliminary in nature. Um, it really has only been thus far between the TPC search and the bank, but that is something that we can consider once the group is initial initialized, we get persons on board. This is something that we can think about and figure out you know, whether there can be some level of connection and, and whatnot. What we just have at this time is really what platform you want to use. Um, that's, you know, there needs to be a sharing of encryption keys. Where is it going to be hosted? Either the bank or TTC. So that is a level of discussion that we've had thus far. So there's something that we will definitely take on board. And as we meet, we will determine, you know, how we can partner, if at all, with the USFSI. Exactly. I see that um, we have a raised hand from Kyron Bailey. Kyron, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Kyron, it, it's it's up to you to unmute and ask a question. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Governor, Deputy Inspector, and the rest of the panel. Um, I had just two quick questions. Um, one, will the guidelines allow for a group governance model? And two, uh, one of the main vulnerabilities that you know, we face with cyber intrusion is staff. Um, would the guidelines require any additional um, requirements as it relates to our employees besides training? For example, we have things like entitlement reviews or restricting external email access um, to only those who require it, um, things of that nature. Would it be so prescriptive or? Would it be up to the banks themselves? Okay. Um, in terms of the first question, um, will it allow for a group governance model? All our guidelines do recognize that there are 
um, financial groups and that there will be group governance. But our, in, our position is that you have to demonstrate how that, that group governance filters into the local subsidiary, right? And how, how practices are adopted at the local subsidiary level in terms of uh, treating with cyber, cyber risk, right? So in t the second question pertain to, if, I, if you could um, indicate the second, second question, in t whether we will be mandating for employees. So the guidelines are not that prescriptive. It, it refers to having, recommending um, um, security awareness training for your staff. And it also speaks to what are the best risk management practices and principles in terms of protecting customer information. It is up to the institution to adapt that. And if it, so we will not be um, telling you really that your employees must do it, but it is, will be strongly encouraged in terms of best risk man management practices to be adopted by your institution. From Joel via WebEx, is there or will there be a mandate and a penalty for a financial institution failing to disclose a breach, uh, given that institutions in the region don't like to share? Michelle? Well, the question's coming my way. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle is on point. Yes. Will there be a penalty or fine? Well, that is not applicable at this time. There is... A, in terms of um, having a penalty for not notifying. We expect the law as it stands requires that financial institutions notify the central bank, the inspector, of any material events. For that reason, we have determined, we have mentioned this in the market conduct guideline that we should be notified of any material incidents and generally inst uh, institutions will abide by that. However, then the definition of materiality has to be determined by the institution, and therefore they will determine what and when they report. But we will strongly encourage um, them to report anything that they consider to be material and in a timely manner. And it is for this reason we have developed this incident and management reporting template, and we will recommend in that template, as in accordance with best practice, a time frame for reporting of a material event, and we will provide guidance as to what we consider to be material events. Thank you, Michelle. Message from Mukta Baluk. I think we kind of addressed this one before, but Michelle, if you could just take it quickly. Does the central bank intend to publicize the fact that a financial institution has had an incident as reported on the template form? Or will that notification or incident be kept confidential? The central bank will not publish that, that, that fact. We will maintain the confidentiality. All information submitted to the central bank is confidential. And we will not publish matters like that in the, in the domain. Yeah. It will be purely internal. Yep. I assume a um, message of... Uh, Question from Marlon Fortune. I assume that the information intended to be shared would be based on techniques, tactics, and procedures of observed threat actors and past incidents, or information gathered from current telemetry analysis and log analysis. So, it's with respect to the ISA and the sharing on information amongst the community. We have to define the parameters and exactly what we want to have shared. Different threat groups and ISACs have um, different ISACs, sorry, have different things that are shared. So one ISAC may give, give you more room to share things around your brand protection, you know, domain, spoofing, you know, things around in the cases of compromise. So it really is up to us who will form the ISAC. Um, to establish the parameters around what we want to have shared. The things that you have mentioned, I mean, that's along the lines of what we are thinking, but it's up to us as we come together to say, okay, we want to start with this. Maybe we'll do this in a phase two. So it's it's still up for discussion, basically. I think the whole question, ladies can join me. I think the whole question about, you know, whether it is law, whether there are penalties, whether people are forced to do things in the market, I think really kind of speaks to a broader issue of market maturity. 
and I don't think that there's really legislation that can bring that about. I, I think having this session today is about broadening and widening that awareness and bringing everybody on board with the hope that we will see a market maturity where people would share responsibly their learnings from different incidents. I think, I think that has to be the thrust of the market as a whole, and it is not an individual um, entity to take on that. Yeah? So I just wanted to interject there. Yeah? Um, we have another question from Facebook. Apart from the cyber risk guideline, does the central bank intend to introduce new regulations or legislation? Michelle? Um, it's something we are looking at in terms of the amendments to the FIA, whether we need to introduce, which is the Financial Institutions Act, whether we need to introduce any provisions to strengthen cyber risk governance or risk management in the, in the legislation. Um, but we are still looking at it. We have not made any decision, but I don't want to say we will not introduce something when, when it's still under consideration. Thank you, Michelle. Another question which was submitted in advance. What are central banks' view regarding the use of artificial intelligence in banking? I think both Keisha and Michelle can contribute to this one. So I think AI, as I said, it presents a, a good opportunity for us. Um, because you're hearing so much about it, you know, you may think that this is something that's brand new to the space. But those of us in the community, we know that our solutions and our vendors have been talking about AI and machine learning for a long time. And from the perspective of a cyber defender, our tools, so some of our tools, have the ability to aggregate data and to help make decisions um, based on different activities, right? So the users, things that they have learned within the environment, and that filtered information is then sent to security analysts, for example, who will then take action. Similarly, we see that in the banking sector, there's a lot of excitement as people are saying, well, we have the opportunity to move to these virtual assistants or to offer these AI chatbots, whereby persons can get a customized response, a human-like response, and improve overall satisfaction. You're also hearing people say, well, we could use it potentially in in risk um, and fraud monitoring because it could look at a lot of data and pull information that's much, much faster than a human can. So where we sit, it is something we know that you can't get away from it. A lot of these technology providers, the Microsofts that you view, you see in where they already have it embedded in products and only more will come um, just in terms of overall risk. Like anything else, you have to ensure that it doesn't introduce a new um, opportunity for these cyber criminals to penetrate your organization. So what I would say is that, you know, of course, it opens the door for us to do things better. It's exciting. Um, and we would expect the institutions to, at some point in time, utilize it. Um, but you have to, of course, go through your own risk assessment um, process. And to Keisha, um, just to say that, the AI and banking is already here. We have institutions using chatbots in their in their business. Um, and our expectation therefore is that they consider the risk of this activity in their cybersecurity field. Thank you. BioWebEx, Ms. Kian Dorman. Good morning, everyone. Great session and information. Kudos to all speakers and panel. Thank you. Question one, is there any time frame for implementation of the guidelines? And secondly, will central bank reviews of financial institutions and organizations be conducted to assess compliance against the guidelines? And if so, what time frame? And Michelle? Sure. Um, yes, there will be a time frame for implementation. When we issue guidelines of this nature, we would normally advise the institutions, we expect them to conduct a gap analysis against the guideline within a, a six month period and submit a board approved, um, a, have a board approved action plan 
to address any identified gaps. Um, that plan should be available to the inspector upon request. And um, that same sort of um, timeline and, and implementation process will be adopted for these guidelines. With respect to the review uh, of against the guideline, yes, this is intended. Once um, we have issued the guideline we will, and given institutions the time to comply, the intention will be then to do some sort of assessment against their of their compliance with the guideline. And that might be by submission of a self-assessment survey in the first um, instance, followed by some sort of on-site verification. And if I could just cycle back, Michelle, on something that you, 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 you spoke about earlier with regards to guidelines, the issue of proportionality. We recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all and that you know, one has to look at the guidelines in terms of the size of your business, the complexity of your business, the risk that your business faces. So, yeah, so we will have to consider that as well. And certainly the businesses will do that. Um, yeah, perhaps I could, I could just um, step in a little bit on this one. If Michelle a brief. <laughs> um, you know, cyber strong cyber defenses are good business practices. So this is what businesses should really be doing on their own. And as, as was said before, most companies and financial institutions already have strong strong defenses. So we are trying to encourage them to keep to keep things uh, in line. What we will be doing is to is to be working a lot on on issues such as self attestation and relying on international standards and so forth. We at the Central Bank are not uh, cyber experts. The team at the supervision department are not cyber experts. They have some expertise. We have an IT department that is that is um, helping, but we really rely on the companies themselves to embrace the spirit of the the guidelines and to do things. On their own, we will of course be checking, but we will not try to be policing every single, um, you know, event or every single um, request. So I just wanted to emphasize that we will be looking for companies to attest that they are that they have been following the practices, that they have been talking to their boards, that their senior management is on train. Uh, we will be looking at it periodically, but I think this is what we want to really focus on self-awareness, uh, education, and implementation by individuals. Thank you, Governor. Via WebEx, message from Edward Mouge. The recommendation to have penetration testing conducted on a production environment is a surprising one as it remains a contentious issue for which no best practice exists. While there are advantages to doing so, there are also clear risks. Having a third party attempt to penetrate a production environment increases the risk of unavailability, unintended business disruption. Additionally, there is a strong likelihood of confidential data being exposed to the third party performing the assessment. Would it not be better to perform pen testing on a clone of the production environment that contains dummy or test data? Tisha, that's right up your alley. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, very valid points. There are always risks once you have somebody trying to conduct these types of exercises. Um, what we want to really have happen is to have the institution utilize environments as close to production as possible. I think that is the intent of the guidance. So if you have a clone of a production with test of a dominator, that's appropriate. What we don't want is to have an institution where your test is very, very different from a production environment. And you walk away with a false sense of security if they test or perform these exercises against environments that are very diverse from a production environment. So I think that you agree is very valid points. Um, the intent is for the institution to understand the vulnerability as to your production environment as, as possible. possible. So, you know, those are very valid things you've raised. And if clarification is required, I'm sure we can amend and adjust as needed. From Kimoy Leon Sin Frederick via WebEx. If there is no penal 
If there is no penalty or fine for institutions failing to notify the central bank of cyber attacks, how will the central bank get institutions to comply and provide the necessary information? Nisha? That's mine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, currently, there is no penalty or fine, except for summary offenses, if we have to go through the court system and have that, that um, executed to have a summary offense. But as I mentioned earlier, where the central bank issues a guideline, the requirement, the there is a process. If you fail to comply with the guideline, then the central bank can issue what we call a compliance direction. So the compliance direction will require you to take some sort of action. Um, it could require you not to stop doing something, right, within a certain time frame. So we can we have other means other than fines in order to bring about a result. And if, if we feel that it's necessary to use those means, we will do so. Thank you, Michelle. Governor, I think I'm going to put you on point for the next question. It comes from Mark Lindsay again. Has the central bank set a timeline for strengthening its human resource capacity to monitor and review cybersecurity compliance in the banking sector that comes under its purview. Is it perhaps a little hopeful to expect businesses that have a vested interest in privacy to be excessively forthcoming about breaches and weaknesses in their cybersecurity profile? Governor? Yes, thanks. With respect to the first thing, it is something that we are looking at actively uh, and continuously. We do understand, as I said before, that we are not experts in the cyber field, but we try to educate ourselves. We have, you know, excellent people like Keisha, Francis, Michelle, all of them that are continuously working on this thing, and we try to, to really understand what is going on. We will be continuing to, to hire people that, that have a certain um, openness, at least to learning about this, even if they don't have the experience, because we think in today's modern world, well, you have to be curious, you have to be looking futuristically, and you have to be able to embrace new learnings, technologies, and, and, and so forth. So it is something that we are looking at very, very carefully, um, because this is part of today's world. And, but as I said before, we do not think that we will be experts in everything. We have a role as a central bank. Uh, cybersecurity is part of the, the landscape because it affects financial stability. But we do not think that we need to be cyber experts. But we do want to encourage a certain sort of maturity, openness, uh, commonality in addressing a threat that could be uh, imminent for all our financial institutions. And we think with that in mind, we'll be able to, to move forward. With respect to, I think, the breaches, yes, of course, people may be uh, reluctant to share information. And I think it could be. Um, understandable. If you have a security breach, you may not want your competitors to know. You may not want the people to know because they may panic your customers, and you may not want the, post, the, the, the bandits to know because they may realize that, oh, there's a vulnerability. So, and as I said before, you have social media that could escalate everything, right? So I think, um, but there is value in sharing at the central bank. We could guarantee that you would have a confidential ear. If you tell us your your problem, some breach or something, this will not go go anywhere. So at least we will be able to to um to understand it and see if there are patterns that others may have um been experiencing and be able to to have something more more general. So I think uh, over time as people get comfortable in sharing things I think we would all be all be better for it. Uh, I remember, I think, as um, Michelle or, or Keisha had said, at the at the central banks of, of the region, uh, one bank found that they had a problem, and then they shared it with us, and we were able to forestall the problem happening here. So I think the sharing is good. It does take some some um, time, some maturity, and some building of confidence. Good enough. This one is for Keisha from Ryan Bidesi, submitted in advance. And I'm going to put the two questions together. Keisha, 
to the senior cybersecurity role on an organization report to the head of operational IT, give the pros and cons. And second question is, a lot of people still think that cybersecurity or information security is an IT function, but it is only a technical role and function. Where are information security, IT governance, risk management, compliance, and data privacy functions fall as regards cybersecurity? Thank you so much, Ryan, for the question. Um, with respect to whether security should report directly to IT, uh, there are different schools of thought. Um, at the end of it, the security function must have a level of independence whereby we can clearly see something is wrong, we need to draw attention to something that's happening in our IT shops. So there are some places where you have the security function that is totally independent of IT. Um, in some cases, the partnership and you working together, sometimes you find there are some dynamics that kind of hinder your effectiveness, um, but it gives you the level of independence that you need. Uh, if you have security reporting to IT, there is a potential that in conflicts, the operations may win out. So, for example, operations may say, well, we can't afford to patch that right now. You guys will just have to wait. Whereas security will say, but it's waited. So, in a case like that, you have a problem. What we have found and what works for us is we have a direct uh, we have reporting to the committee, IT committee, board, or whomever you have. So that they could say, well, wait a minute, we have to weigh the two. There are pros and cons to either approach, but at the end of it, the security function must have a level of independence and they must be able to say, hey, something is wrong and we need it to get to the right people. Um, with respect to the second question, thank you, Ryan, for giving me the opportunity to get on my soapbox. Security is everybody's issues, not just. IT security, you know, everybody has to pay attention to it. From our end users, they have a role to play. Those that are developing applications, you have to do it well. It has to be a part of your systems development. Those who deploy systems, you know, manage networks, you have to harden them. It's everybody's business. And with respect to governance, we need our board, we need our leadership to set the right tone. They need to say, come on. This is a something that is important to the institution. So everybody has a role to play with respect to data privacy. That is a business decision. So if the business says that this data is confidential, then security can say, well, okay, these are the controls that we recommend. So it's really, it's really something that everybody has to have a part in. It's not just one team's responsibility. And I think we can all agree, you know, that everybody has a role to play. So thank you so much. Thank you, Keisha. Comment from Richard Young via WebEx. Surely before a license is renewed by central bank, they must be satisfied it has mitigated itself as much as possible. Just remember, we are dealing with bandits in a different form. Central bank must be hard and keep it. Michelle? Thank you, thank you Richard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard, for that. Um, in terms of how the licensing process is, is, once a license is issued, especially for the banking and insurance, um, you have the, on, the supervision that, and regulation that takes place thereafter on an ongoing basis. So you may lose your license or have your, your license um, impaired or restricted if we, we determine that, that you have excessive risk in your operations that cannot be mitigated, right? But it's not like an annual renewal process that we, we check a box every year. And if you don't meet the thing, we take away your license. I hope that answers your question. But yes, cybersecurity will be one of the, the issues we are hoping that we are looking to see if it's well managed within your organizations. Thank you, Michelle. From WebEx, question from Bradley. What regulatory frameworks or guidelines is the central bank followed to maintain robust cybersecurity practices? Keisha, that's right on your quote again. Thank you so much, Bradley. Um, we utilize ISO 27001. We also utilize the US based NIFT. So we follow the framework as well as we adopt like their, their specific guidelines. So let's see that we put the three to give us specific guidance on how we look at data and network controls 
We also consider the Center for Internet Security. Um, so we, we consult different ones, um, but overall the ones that we are here to understand I see. Excellent. Thank you. Michelle, I'm going to put you back on point here. Question from Kimoy Leon Singh Frederick from the Express. What is the biggest cybersecurity threat for banks in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, I will say for financial institutions, but seeing our things like phishing and, and ransomware. Uh, two of the, the biggest issues that we, we have noticed. Thank you. And Michelle, staying on point from Stephen Nichols. Is the central bank conducting cybersecurity surveys as part of its off-site monitoring or to direct thematic reviews or other reviews? If not, is it being considered? Um, the short answer is yes. We will be using surveys and we have used it in the past and we will continue to use surveys as part of our off-site monitoring process. Good. From Dwayne Eiffel. What infrastructure will be put in place to facilitate the sharing of threat intelligence data? How will privacy be maintained? Thank you so much, Dwayne. Um, with respect to the ISA, the platform that we are considering is an open source one known as MISC. Um, any participants in the ISA, we will provide you with an encryption key so that we ensure that the communication is secure. And then in terms of the actual um, sharing of information, institutions themselves can upload or we can have the host um, provide and share the events, the entire community. So in that case, only the host will be aware of which institution is sharing. So these considerations are things that we have to look at when we meet as a team to determine the best approach and the comfort level of our institutions. But just on the preliminary discussion, the TTC search, that is the, the thinking behind it. Follow-up comment from Richard Young. Thank you, Richard. Creating and facilitating an aura of secured comfort is crucial, especially to the public. Must also address in your financial literacy efforts. Central Bank must be commended in getting this topic into the national conversation and awareness. Well done. Thank you, Richard, and that's exactly what we aimed to do today, to start the conversations and to get the market as a whole uh, sensitized and working as in unison as one. As we know, in, in, in this business, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And if there is one entity that fails, the contagion effect could be profound. So we need to all get on board. Another question from Dwayne Eiffel via WebEx. Will the draft guideline include or reference sample plans and policies which licensees can build upon? Good question. Good suggestion. Michelle? Hi, Duane. Um, No, it will not but include sample plans or policies. That is, um, we consider that to be too prescriptive. The guideline does mention elements that should be covered in your plans and policies, but the the institution will have to build out on those those things in terms of the best practices but we will not provide samples plans and policies governor i'm going to put you back on point here comment from mark lindersey i must confess that i'm not heartened by the central bank taking the position that they are not cyber security experts the discussion as documented in the imf report suggests that the central bank was advised of shortfalls in its capacity to review banking compliance. Surely the growth of cybersecurity threats suggests that the central bank should be ramping up its capacity to understand the nature of digital crime and to evaluate the quality of defenses against it. Thank you, Mark, and it's one that we have, we have discussed at great length internally, but I will allow the governor to take lead on this. Yes, thanks for that comment, and I think, but at, at um, we could say that we are experts, but we are not. And I think it's important to start with a clear understanding of what you are and what you aren't. And I think this is where the IMF um, technical assistance report came in. And why we published it is because we think it is important for transparency, accountability, and example for the community. So we do 
have a certain understanding. As I say, you could see the, the, the panel, you could see the expertise and so forth. But we still have a lot to do, and we are on this journey, and we are dedicated, and we will continue to, to do so. And we certainly uh, welcome comments from, from commentators like you and others so we could continue to improve and to get the community stronger because uh, we don't want to have a threat that, that as, a, as a financial community, we are not prepared for. Um, but it takes a lot to happen, and we will continue to, to work together to, to improve. But thanks for that comment. Thank you, Governor. I see we have a raised hand from Patricia Rosil. Patricia, if you like, you can turn on your camera and mute and ask your question. Or just unmute yourself then. I can unmute. I'm not quite sure the camera is going to come off. Um, we hear you clearly. See. Okay. Um, my question is really around the, the sharing initiative. The, there are a number of regional bodies in, in terms of central banks and regulatory authorities within across the Caribbean region that are setting up um, sharing, sharing of intelligence. And from where I sit, I think it's important that we not only share into, um, within a particular island or jurisdiction, but we share across the region because something can start in Antigua and overnight it could be in Trinidad. And coming from a regional bank, First Caribbean, I want to understand what plans there are to not only have the sharing of information within Trinidad, but if there are plans for, for this sharing to be region-wide. Absolutely. Keisha? Those yeah. are very good comments, and it is something that we will take into consideration. Um, the initial discussion is just sharing really is just centered within country, um, but it is a good suggestion that you give on that maybe we need to expand the scope a bit. Um, just in terms of central banks, we do have an information sharing group, but with respect to the entire sector, maybe that is something that we can consider. So thank you very much for the recommendation. And we will definitely take it under consideration. Question from Facebook from Ken Jarvis. How does the central bank deal with individuals who behave without regard for the FIU TT? I don't know that um I don't know I don't know that we are necessarily in a position to respond to that. <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that is the I could take a, a shot at it. I'm not sure exactly, um, but I'll, I'll try to take a shot at it. As I said, we are, we are a community in the financial sector. The FIU is looking at financial intelligence that is released to money laundering and so forth. The central bank is a part of that community, and we work with them closely because we realize that if you have financial transactions that are not uh, proper and that uh, encouraging or part of, of criminal activity, then you could have threats and um, vulnerabilities throughout. So we work very closely with the FIU. We don't get involved in the minutiae of all the, all the details, but some information comes to us. We share it with the FIU. We have a, an arrangement to share, to share data. So I think we, we do work together, but we don't prescribe some of the you know the requirements for money laundering and so forth on an individual basis that the FIU would be um, uh, handling. We do have even on the fintech side when we talk about licensing e-money issuers and so forth, and when we had the demonetization, and when we talk with about um, national anti-money laundering things, we, we liaise with them very closely, and I think we will continue to do so. But our forty. And our responsibility is not for individuals per se. I hope this kind of answers your question. I'm just going to, um, I understand that the last part of Keisha's um, commentary earlier wasn't heard. So I'm going to just ask her to repeat the answer to the question what type of threat Central Bank has seen the most of? Keisha, can you just repeat that again? Uh, sure. So we see a lot of fishing. Um, three directs and malicious attacks. Seeing evidence where
brute force. But the, the main one is, is food pressure. Thank you. Um, from, comment from Richard Young. I know that annual licensing is not part of the regulatory process right now. I was suggesting that Central Bank should put that on the table. As a regulator, you have a responsibility to ensure the financial institutions in whatever form they conduct their business in a safe and secured manner. The world has changed what is international best practice, talking about IT and cybersecurity and not other aspects of banking. Michelle, you want to take a first pass at that and then Kisha, I think, can respond to the lower part. Huh? I can. Um, probably I'll start with what is international best practice. And international best practice does not dictate annual licensing for entities like banking and insurance. Um, as, as you may be aware, licensing process is a very intensive exercise, and it's not possible to do an annual licensing review for every licensed financial institution um, because you do have limitations to your resourcing in any, in any institution. So that's why the best practice is to conduct ongoing risk-based monitoring of your financial institutions. So where you have determined that an institution poses excessive risk in their operations, you take the required, the requisite regulatory action to mitigate that risk. But the best practice is not annual licensing of these types of institutions. Well, it's been, uh, it's been lots of great questions and comments there. We appreciate that. Um, we'll, uh, we'll make a last call for any questions at this time. Um, anybody, anybody still there that would like to raise a last question? The, um, the video of this morning's session will remain on our website, so you can refer to it. I do understand that people on the live stream were having connectivity issues, but again, the, 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 the video from this morning's session will be made available on the website. Um, we do have a closing comment from Claire Gomez Miller. Commendations are extended to Central Bank for this initiative. It provides a timely platform to ensure all financial institutions are managing cybersecurity risks individually and collectively. These risks have been escalating as the perpetrators have become more innovative in their attacks and demands. I look forward to the central bank's guidelines and their continued support in providing best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for that. Um, I, and I think you are singing from the same hymn, hymn sheet as us. You know, um, it is becoming more fierce out there. We cannot, we cannot let our guard down for one minute. Um, and it is not an individual effort. This is a complete, absolute team sport from the smallest of entities to the largest of entities. The contagion impact is real. The connectedness in, in, the, in the global landscape is real. Caribbean-wide, global ride. We all have to get it right and we have to stay vigilant. Um, so it looks like we've come to the end of, the, of today's session. I truly appreciate everyone's participation. Sorry, Governor. Yeah, perhaps I could, could, could um, uh, share a few things. First of all, I'm um, really, I started off excited and I'm more and more excited as, as, the, as the time goes on because I'm hearing, you know, the technical people joining us in our, in our um, presentation today. I'm learning some of, these, some of the acronyms. I don't even know what they are, but, but I'll find out at some point in time. But it is really heartening that, that there's so much interest. There's so much... Um, capacity in the in the country i think we could we could go a long way uh we have the international standards to guide us but we have the local talent expertise and interest because we know we are in this together and we have a lot to do uh i think um just to to, to chat on richard's point about annual attestation or annual licensing i think the, the issue is not so much that you will pull a license on an annual basis but that you have an ongoing kind of affirmation of, of, um, of standards. And I think this is what we want to have in the self-attestation because it does reflect that, that you have to always be on your guard. We will know that there are some cyber crimes, some skimming, some ransomware, but these are already, in a sense, in the past, there's something new being developed. 
now. Some things are coming up and we have to be always aware and, and be ready for the next for the next event. So I just wanted to thank everyone for their for their participation and, and I look forward to continued engagement. In terms of um, what we are planning, uh, in early September, we are going to mount um, a WebEx like this on, um, on crypto asset uh, regulation issues in the consideration. So, so, so look out for that. Again, that would be something that is, is quite timely that is upon us and we want to, to, be, to be prepared for, for that. Thank you, Governor. Once again, thank you all for your participation this morning, and uh, the recording will be on the website. Thank you on behalf of the Central Bank.